Uh, my name is Mark Studley. I'm, um, for the last 15 years at IBM, I've worked on and led the people who work on the AOT and JIT compiler technologies that are uh, now at the Eclipse OpenJ9 um, open source project. Um, it's, been a, <laughs> it's been a wild ride at times, but um, we're currently at the point where our, our dynamic AOT technology is performing within about 5 to 10 percent of peak JIT performance. Um, now, that uh, technology may not be quite the same in your, as the notion you might have of AOT compilers in your head. So, in this talk, I thought I'd just do a, a little bit of a, um, a looking at st what's the state of the art in AOT and JIT compilers uh, across the Java ecosystem. Um, I'll add a little bit of commentary from my perspective, and then um, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, where I think things might go. Uh, so I mentioned that I work for IBM. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, really, I thought I'd start by just kind of giving a brief tribute to all of the um, amazing and diverse investment and, and sort of development work that's gone on across the entire Java ecosystem for more than two decades uh, into developing really effective code compilation technologies uh, for Java applications. It's really an amazing uh, set of things when you start looking back at it. I think pretty much every item on this list represents a project where the more than 10 years of developer effort, and in some cases more than hundreds of years of developer effort has been invested in trying to make code compilers really amazing in the Java ecosystem, and there's a very diverse set of projects that have been here. And I haven't even listed all of the work that's been done by both industry and academic researchers and the countless graduate students who have invested in trying to push the state of the art forward over the last two decades. So I just wanted to start by saying, you know, great job to everyone for all of the work that we've done so far, but there's still more to happen. If we look at the sort of the set of primary projects in the Java ecosystem that are doing native compilation right now, um, obviously, everyone's familiar with the hotspot JITs um, in OpenJDK. They're the reference native compilers and probably the most used across the industry. Um, uh, there have been some interesting enhancements here, um, including JRampUp, which I think we're going to hear more about later in the day. Uh, Eclipse OpenJ9 is a, a, a different implementation of a JVM, which includes its own JIT compiler technology that was built from scratch. Uh, it's, a, it's a JIT compiler with multiple adaptive optimization levels that use temperature as a metaphor, so you can have cold, warm, hot, very hot with profiling and scorching compiles, just depending on how much time uh, the compiler thinks it's worth investing. Historically, we've offered uh, traditional AOT compilation in this, uh, in this technology uh, for the embedded and real-time space, but that's really historical at this point. We don't really um, go down that route uh, at the current moment. Um, what we would really do is cache JIT compilations, uh, which is a technology we call dynamic AOT, I mentioned before, alongside classes in our shared class cache uh, in order to provide uh, sort of the advantages of AOT and JIT. There's the Falcon JIT, which is based on LLVM that's been produced by um, Azul, uh, which uh, is an alternative high opt compile to C2. Uh, it can also stash JIT compilations um, in, in, to disk and reload in subsequent runs. And then there's the Oracle Graal compiler, which um, unlike the other three, is written in Java, which is kind of neat, uh, and it can interact with the hotspot VM or another VM by JVMCI. It's been available since Java 10 as an experimental uh, AOT compiler on uh, x86 platforms. Um, sorry, it's also, it's a, sorry, that's since Java 9. Since Java 10, it's been available as an experimental JIT alternative to C2. Uh, and also there's, uh, as part of the Graal VM project, you can create native images uh, using substrate VM uh, if you're, uh, um, willing to um, limit yourself to a subset of the Java language. For the remaining set of the talk, I'm going to just basically compare uh, state of the art um, across these JIT and AOT and, and what I'll call caching JIT uh, uh, compilers. And then I'm going to talk about taking JITs into the cloud, and that's where I really think there's some interesting opportunities here for code compilers to do even more things than they've been doing in the last 20 years. And finally, I'll wrap up. So let's start by kind of um, thinking about what a running Java application looks like from the point of view of the code that's being uh, used to run that application. So everything starts with a big bang, right? The Java process starts, and uh, the JVM has to load itself and initialize itself and get ready to, you know, kind of load the very first classes so that it can get to the point of being able to run the main uh, method of the, of the application. 
if that's the way it's being invoked. At some point later on, the JVM has loaded some number of classes, and it's finally ready to run the, the main method or whatever the entry point is of the, of the application that's running here. For OpenJ9, this means about 750 classes get loaded. The number may be slightly different from Hotspot, but the timing is actually quite similar between OpenJ9 and Hotspot for, for, these, uh, for, this, for this phase of, of startup. Um, at this point, there's really only a handful of class loaders, uh, and in fact, only one has been doing most of the work. Um, and, and it's uh, actually a relatively simple world. I'm using these two arms here. You can kind of see the metaphor growing here. I'm trying to uh, uh, liken this to the, uh, to the creation of the universe a little bit. <laughs> um, so as you go forward, the application starts loading its classes, and this is actually a phase of quite active class loading. Um, in very, very large applications, you'll see lots of different class loader objects being created, maybe even hundreds, and you might see um, uh, applications loading tens of thousands of classes in the extreme. Not every application, obviously, is going to be that large, but you do see these things in the wild. Um, eventually, you get to the point where you're, the application is actually ready to do its work. It's initialized all of its data structures, it's loaded a lot of the classes that it's going to need, um, and it's ready to start exercising those code paths. At this point, I consider that the application started up. So when I talk about startup, that's the point where the application has got to the point where it's about to start doing work. Um, Going forward, it's exercising its code paths. It's either trying to solve a particular problem and it's exercising the code paths that it's going to use to do that, or it's receiving transactions and those transactions are driving the code paths that are going to be frequently active during uh, the program run. And eventually, those code paths are going to stabilize and the profile stabilizes and uh, things get a lot um, sort of easier or less sta more stable, let's just say. So if we look at this from the perspective of the sort of two main types of compilation, JIT compilers are active at runtime. They're inside the JVM process. They're in the middle of all of this happening. So they can look at everything that's going on in the application, all the classes that are loading, all the code paths that are being running in that precise invocation of the application. And from an AOT's perspective, you're really trying to look at that whole process from even before the Big Bang, at least in the... Um, sort of traditional AOT, like the pure AOT sense, when you don't have any information about what's going on at runtime. Um, you're trying to look at this whole process from before it even happens and trying to predict what's going to happen and optimize code based on what you can, what you can figure out. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper into uh, comparing things here. So we'll start with JITs just because JITs are sort of the, the leading uh, technology at the time, right? As I mentioned, they compile, everyone knows they compile at the same time the program runs. And after more than two decades of sustained effort in um, investing in JIT compilers, they really are the best. Um, and that's despite even multiple significant efforts, parallel efforts aimed at improving AOT performance um, and sort of coming around again uh, in AOT performance uh, to, to, to address some of the um, still limitations of JIT compilers. Now, why is it that JIT compilers are the leading compilation technology here. I think there's at least two reasons, um, and if you squint a little bit, they're really kind of the same reason. The first is speculating on class hierarchy. So calls in Java are virtual by specification, we know that, but many calls have only a single target in a particular program run. It doesn't necessarily mean that a call has only a single target across all of the possible runs of the application, but in one particular run, we know, um, you know at, by looking at many, many programs that it's common for them to be um, uh, have only a single target. And it may also be true across lots of runs, but it doesn't have to be. Um, JITs can speculate that that one target will continue to be the only target and they can watch the program as it runs to try and react if things uh, go uh, differently. And then you can speculate, you can optimize aggressively um, as inside, from inside the JVM and keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into call chains. So if you look at um, even a warm compile, which is kind of the baseline compiles that uh, OpenJ9 uses, um, you can inline hundreds of methods into a compiled method. And you know, anytime you have to stop because you don't know quite what you're going to inline or you're not you know, pretty sure that that's the target that you're going to inline, you pretty much have to stop that whole process and you, you might cut off an entire part of the call graph that might have some very interesting opportunities to optimize with the code around it. Speculating can, can greatly expand that ability to inline those call targets, um, which gives you that optimization scope. And um, you have, we know that we have to be a little bit careful here because if we compile too early, uh, we can get 
invalidations that, um, that can basically make the code that we've generated less optimal. And if we just waited a little bit longer and waited for a few more classes to load, we would actually get the right answer. Um, but, but, so we can't compile too early. And this is one of the effects that um, help, uh, uh, makes it harder for JIT compilers to do well at startup and ramp up. The second one, which as I mentioned is kind of sort of the same, uh, is that JIT uses profile data. Um, quite aggressively, actually. So, you know, we all know code paths don't execute, not all code paths ex execute equally frequently. <laughs> um, and JIT compilers are really good at biasing the optimization effort that they make onto the code paths that it knows are running frequently. It's very, the optimizers can be very well tuned in order to favor the, the code paths that are executing, and they may even penalize some of the paths that look more rare in an effort to make the frequently executing paths run faster. That's a very standard trade-off when you're building optimizers for JIT compilers. Um, not all calls do have uh, a possible, a single target, right? So polymorphism does exist, it's not a myth. Um, there are cases where that call needs to go to different places, and so uh, profile data here can help you prioritize and even enable inlining in cases where, yes, multiple things could happen, but really it's only this one or these two. Uh, and really this profile data becomes a very efficient substitute for um, not being able to do larger scope analyses at runtime, right? JITs, they run at the same time as the application, you can't afford to take a minute to analyze <laughs> the program to figure out what's going on. Profile data actually gives you, a, in some cases, can give you um, a, a good substitute for that because it can identify constants um, that are like things that are true at this, at this site um, based on uh, just what things flow through it. Um, if it is an actual constant, you don't have to prove that it's a constant. The profile data will suggest that it's a constant. Um, and so this contribu helps contribute to JIT compilers having practical compile times uh, while still being able to provide very good performance. But accumulating a good profile takes some time. And again, that pushes back on trying to uh, provide excellent startup and excellent ramp up because the earlier you go, you don't have as much profile data to make the right decisions and so that hurts your peak performance. And so if you really want high peak performance, you have to wait to get the profile data. Uh, and JITs are very good at doing this when the profile data is high quality. If it's not high quality, then you can make mistakes and it, and it does affect uh, the performance that you can get. Now, this performance advantage isn't free, obviously. The JIT has to do a bunch of work in order to collect that profile data. Um, and that, that price is, again, paid at startup. So, um, you know, while the code is being interpreted, which can slow the startup and ramp up process. Um, and um, um, as I said, the quality profile means you have to profile for a while. And if you don't get the right profile, you can get uh, wor worse performance. Uh, the compilers themselves, by running at the same time as the application, consume resources, transient resources, in the case of the compilation itself, right? It compiles CPU cycles. Um, you know, JIT compiles can take milliseconds up to even seconds for very aggressive compiles um, and can, can consume hundreds of megabytes of memory while they do compiles. It goes away when the compile ends, but still that transient use is there. Um, this cost is, is paid primarily while you're compiling, and you primarily compile during startup and during ramp up. So again, this is, you know, I'm, I'm building the case for why JITs are not so great at startup and ramp up. Um, and, and, the, and another effect here is that it may take time to get to full speed, because if I've got a queue of a thousand methods that I've got to compile, it takes time to chew through that queue. And so that again delays um, the, the time that it takes to get to native code performance. There's also some persistent resource consumption here in terms of the table and the profile data that gets collected. Um, but this is, I would say, a relatively more minor than the sort of transient spiky stuff that can happen when you're doing JIT compiles. So if I were to sort of summarize all that in a, in a, in a table with one column so far, <laughs> um, there are a bunch of things that JITs are good at, right? They provide really great code performance. They have a really great ability to adapt to runtime changes. They're really easy to use, right? Does anybody even remember how to disable the JIT compiler? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so yes, there is a way to disable it, but almost everybody just runs with it enabled and it just works, right? You don't even have to think about it. Um, you get platform neutral deployment. That's one of the advantages of the JIT compiler is that because you're only, comp you're only committing to the platform at the time that the application is running, your actual, the thing, the artifacts that you deploy, you know, class files, jar files, war files, whatever, can be platform neutral. 
But startup is a problem. Um, you know, remember, startup is the time until it's ready to handle load or to start solving a problem. Ramp up, which is the time until it reaches the steady state performance. And um, obviously, there's, there, there are um, uh, resources being consumed at runtime, which interfere with the application's ability to consume those resources. So it's good. And we've sort of, as an industry, we've kind of decided that the green boxes are more important to us than the red boxes. But everyone really wonders whether, you know, for two decades, everyone's been wondering, maybe AOT can really help with some of these red boxes and try to make things better. Um, and the quick answer is that, yes, you can improve on those red boxes, but you might pay a price in some of the green boxes. And historically, the prices that you've paid in the green boxes have not been uh, worth it for the, the broad set of people using Java, so across the entire ecosystem. Um, so, okay, let's, let's talk about AOT a little bit. So AOT is really introducing an extra step uh, to generate code before you deploy your application, right? You're going to run a command like JAOTC to convert class files, and it generates a shared object, which can then be loaded by your, your JVM, and poof, you have native code sitting there ready to execute. It's uh, very similar to how static compilers work in more static languages like C, C++, Rust, Go, Swift, et cetera. Um, this is still considered experimental, I believe, um, and it works on x86-64 platforms, which kind of helps a little bit with the platform neutral part, but not completely. Um, <laughs> there are two deployment options which you have to decide when you're building if you are going to use AOT without a JIT, so you only want to use the native code that you compile with AOT, and interpreter, I guess, for everything else, or if you want to build with a JIT at runtime, in which case hooks get built into the code so that it can trigger recompiles uh, where it makes sense. Uh, AOT obviously has some important runtime advantages over a JIT compiler, right? Because the compiled code performance is, is, is poofing into your process as a shared object, you get that code performance immediately. You don't have to wait for the JIT to compile it, you don't have to wait for um, it to get to the point where it gets compiled and then, and then compiled. Uh, startup performance can be 20 to 50 percent. Um, that's just a spitball. Um, better if you, if especially if you combine it with the app CDS um, technology that uh, that's also available with Hotspot, and it reduces the CPU and memory impact of the JIT compiler because you aren't using a JIT compiler, right? Anything, any of any code that you're, you, you've compiled with AOT, you don't necessarily need to compile with the JIT, so you've saved something at least uh, to the degree that you don't use uh, the JIT compiler. But there are a few. But, <laughs> um, well, first of all, so you no longer are platform neutral, right? Um, it's, yes, it's true, it's only, it's, it's the x86-64 is the supported hardware platform right now, but there's still different um, uh, deployment platforms, Linux, Mac, and Windows, and the way that you package your code on those platforms is different. So you now have to decide and build different artifacts for different platforms if you're going to support those different platforms. And there are some other usability issues here, right? So it, it, it works best, as I understand it, if you target, if you tell it the set of methods and classes that you care most about. Otherwise, I mean, you can tell it to compile the world, but that takes a long time and you probably aren't running the world. So, and most people who are using it um, actually do a run of their application to find out what classes you're touching, what methods you're actually using at runtime, and then they compile those ones. Um, but keeping that list um, and maintaining that list uh, when your applications are changing, when your uh, dependencies are changing across all the applications that you're using, if you are working on a large number of applications, keeping that list curated and uh, appropriate and correct for your AOT deployments is actually a task that, well, it, it's, it lands on the user, right? You have to maintain that list. You have to keep figuring it out. And it, and it, remain, uh, sorry, and it relies on running the application first, which you can run it like it, it depends on the profile, on, on what input data you give to that particular run to get that set of things that you're going to run with. Um, and the obvious question is, what about classes that aren't available until the run starts? Right? If you don't, if you can't see the class, you can't compile it. So you're kind of stuck on those ones. Now, if we start looking about performance, this is where we get into the more controversial parts of this talk, probably. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you look at the two things that I mentioned in my talk earlier, the ability to speculate on class hierarchy, um, yes, you can still do that ahead of time, but you may not be able to see everything, and it may be hard to look through all of the uncertainty to make really good decisions, or at least decisions that are as good as the JIT could make in those same circumstances if it can see exactly what the class hierarchy is. 
And profile data is, well, in a pure AOT sense, you don't have profile data, right? There is no profile data that you can use because you're looking at it before the program runs. So in their purest form, AOT compilers can only really reason about what's happening at runtime. And things like modularity help a little bit because they establish sort of dependencies and, uh, and, and help you figure out what class loading is going to happen at, at runtime so you can predict better what it is that's going to happen at runtime. But not everything uses modularity and um, there are, in fact, large classes of applications that don't use modularity, uh, and it can be hard to see through all of those things. So um, I'm going to use a very simple example here, which uh, I'm sure is going to make people itch to ask questions, but um, I'll ask you to hold off. <laughs> Just let me, let me get through it. So imagine a very simple case where you have two classes, B and C. We've got class um, C on the, on, the, on the left. We've got B on the right. And uh, C has a class, a, a method foo in it, which is going to uh, get a B and then call B.bar. And so if we look at this very simple example, there's only one B, and so the only target that could possibly happen for B.bar is to return five. Um, and so we might be very tempted to just inline that into uh, the code in foo and then further optimize based on that number five, we might be able to optimize code paths, improve inlining, and so on. But the real identity of B here is determined by the class loader that's used to load C in, uh, when in a program run. So I've shown a, a potential class loader in the first one, which um, loads C, and then when C goes to resolve what the constant pool entry for B is, um, it, it finds the B that we, we know about and everything works uh, hunky-dory. But these class loader objects, they only exist really on the Java heap. They don't really, there is no sort of persistent notion of what a class loader is, uh, which makes it a little bit hard to reason about these things. Um, so what if I had a second class loader, um, which somehow resolved to a different B? Maybe that B didn't exist at compile time. Maybe it only poofed into existence because, I don't know, I asked to profile something or I asked to trace something or or that's just the way the program works, right? There are lots of frameworks that poof up classes dynamically. Um, and so in this case, now I kind of have to back off on this optimization. If, if, this, if this can happen, I have to be very careful about inlining any particular b.bar into my class c.foo. And notice that there's no relationship here between c and b. They're just, there's a constant pool entry in c which says, has the string b in it, which then gets resolved at runtime to a particular b. Um, in fact, it might even be the execution of c.foo that resolves, that figures out what the actual b is in a particular scenario. So, you know, there might only be a, a, a class loader one object, there might only be a class loader two object, or there might be both. And so, again, in a pure AOT case, you probably have to just hedge and, and not inline b.bar which then might block other optimization opportunities, right? You can imagine having a constant five there might actually help the JIT to generate better code downstream of that call. Is this a contrived example? Well, a little bit, but it's kind of modeled on how OSGI class uh, module, uh, modules work, um, where you can enable different versions of the same library to be loaded and referenced by different parts of your application, i.e. the jar file hell problem. Now, nobody likes the fact that there is jar file hell, but in, it's a reality in some places. <laughs> Um, so you have to ask yourself, what prevents this scenario from happening if classes can be loaded dynamically and even created on the fly, right? AOT, in order to um, optimize code to the same degree that JIT compilers can, it has to be able to see through and optimize all of that stuff um, um, without having seen an execution. Um, and the JIT, on the other hand, it's free to act however it wants, right? If only one class loader object gets um, allocated and loads one particular B, it can inline that one. If both of them are there, it can choose to inline the individual b.bars into the Cs that reference them, right? So those two Cs in the diagram, um, those two Cs are really different classes, right? The JIT compiler doesn't even have to know that they're kind of the same class, even though they are. Um, there are two different runtime instances of the class, and you can compile c.foo differently in each of, for each of those classes. So the JIT can really highly tailor its code for these scenarios. Um, whereas AOT will probably have to hedge here, and every inlining hedge reduces optimization scope, which increases the gap to, uh, to JIT code performance. Um, more controversial stuff. <laughs> uh, so 
fallacies that I hear a lot about um, that people speak when they, when they talk about AOT compiled code, they think that AOT is just going to be faster than JIT. Um, for the pure pro, from the pure experience they have of static compilers generating fast code or faster code than, than what a Java um, um, code or application run experience is like. Um, I'm going to claim that AOT compiled code is typically going to perform at 50 to 90 percent of the JIT compiled code. Now, I don't have data to show you that backs up that number, so you're perfectly free to completely ignore me. But um, I think from, from my experience looking at AOT compilers across a large number of applications and including some very large applications, AOT compiled code is um, often a lot slower. Um, without profile data, it's really hard to compete with what the JIT is capable of doing. Now, I'm sure we'll hear more about this in the, 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 um, the, the presentations to come and all the amazing things that people are going to do to try to fix this problem, but I think the current state right now is, is um, I think this is a reasonably fair depiction. Um, a second fallacy, Java JIT compilers are automatically good Java JIT or sorry, AOT compilers. Um, and that can be true. Um, it's not provably not true. <laughs> but, um, but JIT compilers, as I mentioned, they tend to assume that they have really good profile data. And so if you don't have really good profile data, then they can start to make some decisions that might make you um, kind of go, huh. Um, they rely on optimization strategies like OSR, which are very steep performance cliffs, right? So they tend to favor one particular execution path, and if you get off that path, you know, you're kind of in trouble. And the profile data might back up that decision because, you know, you know that that path is the only path that's ever executed in this program run. But, um, <laughs> but if it's not, um, like if one program run happens to go on one path and another program run happens to go on the other path, the AOT code can be wrong half the time. And OSR, when you fail, it's a very steep uh, price to pay. So the typical thing is to hold back on something like that when you don't have good profile data to recommend to do those optimizations, you just don't do those optimizations. And that again increases the gap between AOT and JIT performance. Um, third fallacy, AOT improves performance because it can compile so many more methods than the JIT can afford, uh, afford to compile. Um, it's true and it's not. It's true from an analysis standpoint, but it's not true from a code coverage standpoint, I don't think, right? JIT compilers are already compiling 99 plus percent of the execution profile of a program, right? You don't see the interpreter spending a lot of time in a typical profile of a Java application. And so compiling more code isn't going to help, right? Amdahl's law is going to limit you to only improving that very small percentage of time that's not being spent in JIT compiled code already. Now, where it helps, is that you can see more classes and you can afford to do analysis on a much broader part of the program than the JIT compiler can, can afford to do. So it's sort of not true, but it's, there's also some truth to it. <laughs> um, and then I guess the, other, the last thing is like, okay, so getting native code earlier, that's the only problem we really need to solve. Um, you have to keep in mind that there, you compile code and then the code has to run. So if you've got lots of things to do at runtime, that's still, you still have to do that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, like getting, getting compiled code performance early doesn't solve your whole startup problem, is I guess my point. And, and, it's, and you can also make big improvements by changing the code that has to run. So the example there is if you look at frameworks like Micronaut and Quarkus, they get a huge startup performance um, advantage versus traditional app servers by changing the way that the app server initializes itself, right? They've rearranged the code and how it executes and how it's structured and how it gets loaded dramatically. And that had a dramatic effect on startup performance. So, you know, don't just look to compilers to solve this problem. There are things that can be done at the application level. All right, so I've, I've kind of um, made fun of AOT for not having profile, any profile information and that's gonna hurt performance. What about profile-directed feedback, right? It's a very you know, sort of well-known technique. It's been around for ages, uh, especially in the static compiler field, where you run the application a few times, you collect some profile data, and you feed that into the AOT compiler in order to let it make profile-based decisions. Um, the, the thing that you need to, that, that is different here from the JIT compiler is that AOT code has to run across all possible executions of your application program. But you probably can't afford to collect profiles for every possible program run, right? The JIT has the advantage because it's inside the run. It gets exactly precise profile data that matters for this run. 
AOT code has to sort of generalize that over all of the possible application runs. And the risk here, it can be misleading to use only a few input data sets, right? Because the AOT compiler can then specialize to that profile data. It will do really great on those input sets, but it may not do very well on other, uh, on, on other input sets. It's easy for the PDF to fool the compiler. Um, and I guess uh, the point that monotonic in one runtime instance doesn't necessarily mean that it's monotonic across all program instances. Benchmarks, uh, in particular, you have to be careful with because they may not stress AOT compilers properly, especially if they're benchmarks that have been developed in the Java ecosystem, right, where the JIT compiler's there, it can run at runtime. We don't tend to think so much about multiple input sets and how well the JIT compiler's gonna do across different input sets because the JIT just targets for whatever you, whatever's running. But if you're gonna use AOT and you're gonna benchmark how well AOT compilers work, you need to be a little bit more careful about this because um, the, these input data sets will uh, affect the quality of the profile data that the AOT compiler is going to use. And those input data sets need to be curated and maintained, right? As your applications evolve and as the data sets uh, maybe, or the, the, the input data that your applications are working with changes, you need to be feeding that back into the process. And so that's, that's more sort of pain for managing uh, AOT compiler. And I guess the, the um, the sort of throwaway uh, point here is that PDF as a technique hasn't been tremendously successful in the static language environment for a lot of these same reasons. Um, there are cases where PDF has provided, you know, performance benefits and it's been useful, but um, it's, it, they tend to be hard fought ones, a hard one, hard fought one wins, <laughs> hard fought wins. <laughs> all right, so let's add this to my table. So. <laughs> Um, not surprisingly, um, all the green boxes turned red, and some of the red boxes turned green, and I gave ramp up kind of an orange, uh, uh, a yellowy color, uh, just because of the sort of performance um, that ramp up can happen faster, but it may not reach the same peak performance, so it's kind of better, but not really. All right, you can also run AOT with a JIT compiler at runtime, and that actually helps mitigate some of the red boxes, right? So it can get your code performance, your steady state code performance up to the same levels that you would expect from a JIT, because you have a JIT. Um, you can adapt uh, better to runtime changes because you've got the ability to recompile code at runtime. So you can get some of these red boxes to be back to, to green, um, but um, in the end, it doesn't, uh, oh, but you also get the price of the JIT compiler with the, with the runtime impact on CPU and although it may be less because you may not have to compile as much as a pure JIT solution would compile. All right, so trying to get sort of a better mix of, or more greens, less yellows and reds, has led us to invest in a sort of caching JIT compiles, right? So the idea is you, you do a JIT compilation, but you store the results somewhere so that you can then load it later. And that way you kind of get the best of both worlds in a way. You get the advantage of the JIT compiler being there at runtime, running something and, and doing very well. And to the degree that the profile matches, you can actually um, you know, reuse that code and get the same performance in the next run. And you can also reduce uh, in the second and subsequent runs the, uh, the, in, in the transient overheads of running a JIT compiler because you don't need to run the JIT compiler anymore. All you have to do is load the code and, and go. Is this really different than AOT? Yes and no. It's really actually both, right? It's, in the first run, it's, it's JIT because you're just doing a JIT compile, but then you're storing the code off. And in the second and subsequent runs, it's like AOT because you're loading code that came from before this JVM came into existence. Um, because the compilation is happening while the application is running, you don't really need a crystal ball to, to figure out what's going on. You're right there in the middle of it, just like the JIT is. Um, and you can use the same data that the JIT would use in the first run, and you can even use that data to make sure that you validate in the second run that you've done the right things. And you can use a JIT in the second run if you have to, 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 um, to react if you've done the wrong things. Um, you can use recompilations to course correct. So um, I kind of mentioned this in the intro. There are two actual implementations of this right now. So uh, Eclipse Open J9 uh, has an open source implementation called Dynamic AOT. Uh, as you can tell, we're really great at naming things, you know, like Open J9, best name in the world. Um, <laughs> everyone thinks it's either Java 9 or Open JDK, but, and it's obviously neither of those. Um, Dynamic AOT is another example of our amazing ability to name things. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, 
So in both cases here, I'm not going to go through these in detail, um, and I would never uh, claim to be an expert on what Azul's compile stashing technology does, but I think from what I've read and, and seen in presentations, it looks largely doing similar kinds of things, although in different ways. So uh, the basic idea, again, is storing JIT compiled code to cache, reusing it later. Uh, in our case, the performance for that loaded code, we've got it to the point where it's at 5 to 10% less than the peak JIT performance, which is actually re you know, really, really, really good, especially if you look at where we started 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's resilient to application changes, so if it, it's, it's kind of a, it's a transparent thing that turns on when you use our Dash X shared classes option. So if you're using shared classes with OpenJ9, AOT code is automatically being stored into that cache and being used in subsequent JVM runs. And if your application changes, you don't have to recompile um, or you don't have to um, uh, throw away that cache necessarily, it will still tolerate the changes and it won't use any code that's not appropriate for the application that you've run. And even if your application starts behaving differently and starts loading things that weren't true in the first run, the AOT code that we generate can tolerate that, figure it out, and recompile it using the JIT in the current run uh, and sort of react to that uh, very well. So that's been available for a long time. It hasn't always been as good as it is right now. Um, but it's, it's there in JDK 8 and later, and I believe that's true for Azul's uh, technology as well um, in JDK 8 and, and, and later. So um, I kind of just said this a little bit, but here's a nice picture. <laughs> Um, so the OpenJ9 shared classes cache is the technology that's used as the basis for this. So on the, on the right, your left, left side, <laughs> um, the shared class cache stores the equivalent of the class files that you, that you have on disk for A, B, C, D, different classes. Uh, it's not actually the class file, it's a pre-processed version that actually allows us to load it faster into the JVM, but it, you can th it's a basically the, all the equivalent information for the class files. We then create these things called class chains, another great naming uh, exercise. Um, I get to take credit for that one. <laughs> um, where at runtime, we figure out um, as you are building the runtime classes that are loading, it actually stores the hierarchy of all the classes that are in that class. So for a runtime instance of a class C, it will know that in this case, C extends B extends A, and it knows that D extends B extends A. It also has ways of tracking what uh, class loader objects are being used in two different JVM runs. It does a sort of correlative uh, heuristic to try and figure out which class loaders in different JVM runs are loading things similarly, and it can base assumptions on that and register assumptions on that for the code that it's compiling. Um, profile data is getting stored into the cache. Um, so when you do a JIT compile, you consume a bunch of profile. You've already collected a bunch of profile data. So on the off chance that we need to reuse that, we actually store that away into the shared class cache, and that may or may not be the right thing, but if you're using a shared class cache for repeated runs of the same application, you're probably okay with that. Um, compiled code gets stored along with metadata and a set of relocation records that basically take the code and bind it into the current JVM with all the addresses where helper functions are and where the classes are actually loaded and the addresses and so on. So the code that you get is actually very similar to the code that you would generate you know, if the JIT were just generating code um, slamming into the same JVM. And then there are also some hints and stuff that we store there to, to try to help tune performance. On the first run, the JIT's going to compile methods after you know, the, the usual thousands of times uh, invocations. Um, and it's going to record, as it's compiling, it actually records the dependencies on the classes and how the class relationships are um, as it's doing its optimization so that it can track exactly what relationships the optimization is dependent on. And if something happens differently in a second run, it can invalidate the code very quickly. Um, in later runs, we load that compiled code much earlier than we would load it, um, than, we, than the time at which we compiled it. So um, we currently do this after about 20 invocations, and the reason for that is basically to let the code path settle and make sure that constant pool entries are already resolved and so on. Um, and, so as, and then as part of uh, binding the code into the JVM at that point, we validate all of those class chains to make sure that they're the same ones that were used when we compiled the code at, uh, in the previous run at the much later time in the, in the application run. So if we add that to our group, we can see I've, I've taken away most of the red boxes get away because it's very easy to use. You just add dash x share classes and it happens. Um, it's platform neutral, so it's, it's great. Um, 
I put, a, I put a, a yellow box in the code performance for steady state just because it's not quite at the same level of performance, but five to 10% is actually pretty good, and we can probably continue to make that a little bit better. But getting it all the way up to the top is probably an exercise in futility, so I'm not, sure, I'm not quite sure when we'll stop that exercise, but we'll keep going as, far, as long as it makes sense. Um, and you know, there's some, there's some stars here in the, in the lower three boxes, so for the, for the second and subsequent runs, you can get very excellent startup, you can get very excellent ramp up, and for the most part, you get very little runtime and CPU um, effort happening, although we do do JIT compiles in order to, to, to top up that extra five to 10%, and so there is still some CPU and memory being consumed in this scenario. All right, so where are we going forward with this? Well, so there's still some not green boxes even in that last one, even for caching JIT. So we started looking at that, we said like, so okay, so what if we could take the JIT out of the JVM client? What if we could turn the JIT into a JIT server? And this diagram kind of shows that, you know, if you've got a lot of different JVMs, and you think you're, ex you're, you're creating an application, you're dividing it into microservices, you have a lot of little JVMs, and each one of those has a JIT compiler that's in there compiling code over and over and over again. What if we took all that and brought it into a single unified consolidated process which you could then manage as a service itself to do, you know, replicate so that it has um, um, high availability and load balancing and so on. The JVM client will still identify what methods need to be compiled because it's got the most uh, tight knowledge about what, uh, what profile is it or what, what's running hot in its JVM. But the actual compile effort's going to be moved off into the server. And then the server may have to ask some questions back and forth across the wire to make sure that it generates code that's appropriate for that JVM. Uh, and then finally, it's going to send the code back, and be, which will be installed in the JVM client's code cache the same way the JIT would install it into the code cache. The benefits are, you know, we can, we can move much of that JIT-induced CPU and memory spikes away from the client. I've shown a little graph here on the, on the bottom, which, uh, you know, kind of that blue line shows the kind of transient memory spikes that you can get from a JIT compiler acting during startup and ramp up in an application. Those are undesirable from the perspective of how much memory is being consumed on the system, right? It may be okay for one JVM to do that, but once you've got multiple JVMs doing that all at the same time, they start interfering with one another. Um, and it becomes hard to predict how much memory you really need to allocate to um, the containers that you're running an application in. The orange line shows what could happen if you can get away, if you can get rid of all that, then the memory profile becomes very predictable because it's dependent on only what the application is doing, which an application developer is gonna have a much better idea of how much memory the application's gonna run. It might not have so much a, a good appreciation for how much memory a JIT compiler that you're not controlling that's acting at random is going to do. Um, the JIT server is connected to the JVM at runtime, so theoretically, there's no loss in performance because um, you get the profile data, you get the class hierarchy info, you can still adapt to changing conditions, um, and you still have that, that nice platform neutrality, so it's easy to use still. But I know what you're thinking, what about network latency? <laughs> Wasn't that gonna hurt startup and ramp up even more? Is this really gonna be practical in the cloud? I'll summarize all three of those as, won't this really just suck? <laughs> So, so we've done some experiments on this, and we were curious about this too when we started, obviously. We didn't know that this was going to work, but we were hopeful, and things seemed to work out. So the one thing you have to remember is that JIT as a service is a tool in the box, right? Just like AOT is a tool in the box, or dynamic AOT in our case, just like JIT compiles are a tool in the box. You can put all those tools together to design a full solution that maybe doesn't have all of the problems that any one of those tools might have. Right, so these graphs on the left side, I've shown a cold run running a, a Java EE benchmark called Acme Air. If anyone's seen me present, you've seen Acme Air being presented. Um, <laughs> this is actually very similar to the result that I showed at Code 1 in the IBM keynote um, last year. So um, on the left side is a cold run. So this is the run where the shared class cache is unpopulated at the beginning. And uh, I know it's a little hard to see the lines, um, but the blue line is uh, sorry, the orange line is kind of the baseline. That's OpenJ9 uh, using an in-process JIT. The blue line is using the JIT server. And so you can see by taking the JIT compiler work, this is the first run, right? So this is where you have to do all of the JIT compiles in the cold run. If you can offload that to a JIT server, which you can give more resources than the client has, then you can actually greatly accelerate the startup and ramp up that you experience. 
uh, in that cold run, which is actually good because a cold run's kind of the one where you pay all the price and it's kind of sucks that there's this one poor first run that gets dramatically penalized compared to everybody else. So this helps actually offset some of that. Um, I should have mentioned that these are running with uh, Docker containers with one processor and 150 megs of memory. So it's a fairly tight environment, right? There's not a lot of resource available to these clients. And so moving the transient work of the JIT compiler out of that environment is actually a, a big win. On the right side, it shows the warm run performance. And uh, you're going to say, wow, that doesn't look great, Mark, because uh, the JIT server is actually doing quite a lot worse on ramp up. Um, and there's a reason for that, and it's called a bug. <laughs> we actually found uh, in this scenario when we generated this data that uh, there were actually a lot more AOT invalidations happening than there should be. And so the AOT code that we were generating in that first run isn't really being used in that second run, right? So in the OpenJ9 case, it worked fine. When you're not using a remote JIT server, it worked fine, and you got that nice, lovely, straight, um, orange line there, but the blue line had to do a bunch of JIT compiles, and so there ended up being that delay. Um, because in this scenario, the JIT server should really be doing exactly the same thing that OpenJ9 is doing, i.e. loading AOT code and not having to do remote JIT compiles, you know, the, the blue line here really, the blue line there, there, <laughs> should really be uh, overlapping with the orange line. There's no reason for it not to be. But unfortunately, I don't have that data, so this is the data I can show you. Um, and in the cloud, well, okay, so those were two machines connected by a network cable. We tried running this in Amazon AWS doing just a, a, a regular deployment in, on two machines in, in the cloud. And on the left, you can see the footprint result. So that's the same actual little graph I had inset on a previous thing. It's showing that if you run OpenJ9 in this environment, you get lots of very spiky memory use. Um, I have to point out carefully that the colors of the lines changed between these two graphs. <laughs> I could make a just-in-time comment about, uh, or a late comment about preparing presentations, but <laughs> sorry, you got what you got. <laughs> um, in this case, OpenJ9 client using an in-process JIT are the blue lines, and the, the JIT as a service or JIT service uh, using remote JIT compiles is using is the orange line, right? So the orange line shows a very, very steady memory footprint, right? You're not using a ton of memory, that, and the memory that you are using is dependent on what the application is doing, so it's more predictable from the point of view of a, a user standpoint. We've gotten completely rid of all that transient gunk that the, the, that the JIT is doing. Um, on the right-hand side, it shows the throughput performance, and um, again, you can see, you know, the, the JIT does a little bit better in a few places, but ultimately, the, the, the JIT server client actually does quite comparably, I would say, to, uh, to a local JIT. And, you know, this is point in time, we'll, we'll get better at this. Um, we're getting, we've been getting better over the last few months, and, and we're still going. So, um, the... If you look at strengths and weaknesses of using a JIT server here, if you, if you believe the data that I'm showing you, then a lot of these boxes just turn to green. Um, and with you know, some of the caveats that you know, after the first run across the cluster of JVMs that you're looking at now, not just the one JVM that, that, uh, that's connected to the shared class cache. And I, on that last lower box, I, I colored it half yellow, half green, because the memory footprint results look fantastic outstanding. The CPU is one area that we're still trying to improve upon. So the one thing that really surprised us was that um, actually when we started, uh, answering questions in the client for the compiles that were happening remotely consumed more CPU cycles in the client than doing the compile. <laughs> Which, well, self-centric guy that I am, I figured, Compilers have got to be one of the most intensive CPU-consuming things you could possibly do. But it turns out that answering questions and serializing objects is actually at least as bad. <laughs> so <laughs> we've been doing lots of work to make this better. It's, it's below half of the CPU use right now, right? So we're caching questions. We used to just naively ask all kinds of questions over and over and over again. We now are doing a better job of caching things. And so we've gotten that CPU consumption down to half of what a local JIT compiler would use. Um, but it's still not sort of where I feel comfortable giving it a full green box. Now, that's kind of the mechanics of taking the JIT out of the, 
JVM and moving it to a remote server. But really, once you've done that, there's a whole host of interesting things that you can start considering, right? So um, you can start looking at AOT with a sort of better usability standpoint, because now you have this independent service that can kind of act and do things independently of what the JVMs are doing without paying any kind of um, CPU or memory overhead inside the clients, right? So it gives you an ability to do ahead of time, ahead of time compiles, but still being connected to the runtime instances that are, that are actually executing. You can watch multiple JVMs in series, so you can start, stop a JVM, start, stop a JVM, start, stop JVM, and understand what's going on across all of those JVMs. You can have multiple JVMs that are active at the same time that are all communicating with the same server. You can aggregate profile information and, and so on. You can learn about um, how an application is running from many different instances of how it's running without being tied to just the one, right? So I think that opens up some opportunities to do some interesting things. Um, you know, generating the right code to get started for uh, across an entire cluster of machines where you might even be able to share that code um, because it's not heavily optimized, but then because I know what's going on in the other JVMs, I can give the top-up code that actually takes you to your peak performance and maybe even beyond where current JITs are able to do. Um, you can do interesting kinds of A-B testing for optimization options. Once you're connected to a cluster of things, you can, you can select victims for optimizations and try out some things. You might want, not want to do that in production maybe so much. <laughs> maybe you would, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but it's an option, it's, it, it's an interesting technique that we haven't really had the uh, ability to do. You can spread the overhead of profiling things across a number of uh, JVMs that are running the same application. You can use machine learning techniques to find out what applications are actually the same without having to be told that this is this application, this is this application, this is this application. You can determine what applications are behaving the same, the same way. Um, you get a gold mine of performance insight and um, you know, uh, even beyond performance, it, it introduces some very interesting ways to service JVMs and JIT compilers. If, you, if, if the service knows what code it has compiled, when it gets a new JIT compiler, you can actually do a whole bunch of stuff offline to say, okay, how many, if I get this new JIT compiler, how much of my code is actually gonna be impacted when I recompile all those methods with this new JIT, all right? So I can, um, I can, uh, convince myself that it's actually a low risk thing to update this JIT, or I can find out that this is actually a JIT that's gonna make some dramatic changes in my executing code profile, so maybe I wanna test a little bit more with this particular JIT. Um, and then there's the interesting opportunities that show up if you, if you have one of these JIT servers running and your development environment is kinda connected to it. That produces an interesting sort of feedback cycle that you can, you can bring the learnings that the JIT server has into the developer's environment and present it in interesting ways. So it might introduce some new interactions between developers and JIT compilers, you know, right from your IDE. Okay, um, I'm probably way over here, sorry. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly wrap up. Um, as we know, JITs are providing the best peak performance and they're still the best if that's what you're really, if that's what you're really, really interested in. AOT compilers can improve startup by 50%, but the steady state performance is very likely to be uh, lower. There are some, in my opinion, serious usability issues. I think the caching JIT approach is actually a much more effective way to, uh, to do AOT-like compilation. Um, but, you know, that being said, there are some cases for, you know, very short-lived programs might work very well with, uh, with the sort of pure AOT approach. Um, maybe not so much in the more complicated examples. Um, the fact that, um, I didn't actually mention this in the, in the presentation, but AOT generates a shared object, which is read-only, that has some nice security properties for some people that's important to some people. Uh, whereas JITs generate writable code, so your instruction stream is actually can change on you at runtime, which can be a scary thing to those same people. <laughs> um, caching JIT compilers are really now at five to ten percent of excellent of of of, uh, of peak performance with excellent startup and ramp up, even for very large, complicated uh, EE, JEE, or Jakarta EE. Um, uh, um, applications, and there's still room to improve here. So it's not like we're, um, you know, we're, we're done. We're not, we're not done on startup and ramp up. There's lots of things that we can continue to be here. And I think we can make some uh, impressive improvements here still without being able, without forcing ourselves to sacrifice compliance. So we're, I think we're gonna come at it from the other end of where the native image work is coming from. So the native image work is coming from a point of, let's see what happens if we throw away compliance and kind of work our way up, I assume. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> I would prefer to look at it from the point of view of let's stay compliant and see how far down we can come. So we may not meet, but uh, I, think, I think there's a, a long way that we can come down before, uh, before we have to consider uh, the compliance issues. Um, and we can also kind of improve the ease of use when you're in an environment where you're using containers. And I guess the last point I'll make is that JIT servers are coming later this year. So we're in the process of merging all of the JIT server work. It's already open source, but it's on a separate branch. We're now merging that branch into our master branch. And so I would expect releases at either the end of this year or early next year to include um, you know, the ability for you to actually use a JIT server yourself in your own environments. And it's really easy. Thanks.